Hi, I'm John Moore with JHM Technologies. Today we're here to talk about an, another myth that's very, very popular in our industry, and it's myth number two. Of course, you remember myth number one being that the closure of the mold will push the fiber into place, and we've talked about that. That's impossible. Uh, you must fit the fiber tight into all the details of the, of the part geometry, forcing the glass into the inner radiuses, and this is so important so as we can control the flow path of the resin. But, you know, the myth number two then is, well, we've hooked vacuum to the cavity and that's going to suck the air out. No, that isn't what happens at all. We have to understand what vacuum really is. It's a measurement or it's an indicator there's a differential in pressure. You have the outside atmosphere that we all live in and we're under pressure here. Now that pressure varies at at our elevation. So let's just keep this consistent and simple in our thoughts. Let's talk about at sea level. So at sea level, we're all under about 14.7 PSI of atmospheric pressure. So if we contain a box, and inside the box it's, it has the same pressure as the outside of the box, well then there's 14.7 pounds all around. However, if we hook a pump to that box, to the interior of that box, and we take that pump, and it's a pump that can pull atmosphere or can pump out air, as it were. It's going to pump the air out of that box. Now we say we have a vacuum in that box. So what we have an effect done is pumped out some of the atmosphere. Now what's outside the box is trying to get inside and equalize the pressures. So we've created a differential. The differential of the outside pressure in comparison to the pressure inside. Now we use the illustration of a box, but really what we're talking about is a mold. So when we're thinking about our molding operations, when we hook a vacuum line to the mold, we're in effect pumping the, the atmosphere out to a given value. Normally in the light RTM process, we pump out about half of the atmosphere. Well then obviously we've left half of the atmosphere inside the mold. That means we still have to influence half the amount of atmosphere that was in that mold to start with, we've got to instruct it, push it, do whatever we need to do to communicate to it to leave at the exit vent. Well, now how does that happen? Well, again, the myth in the industry is, well, I've hooked vacuum to it, so it's like a Hoover vacuum cleaner. It's sucking the air bubbles out. That's not how it works at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about just how it works to have the atmosphere leave the mold. Now, the first thing that's critical, and it's what we teach in the class, is how to create an accurate tool. I took a part here. This is a tub for a medical cell saving device. In fact, uh, one of our other videos online shows the aviator, our semi-automatic machine, making it so simple and easy to inject this part. And you can watch that video in, in another time. But when we were done making the part, we took it off. And I it'll just a moment ago here, I just highlighted this section of it just to show you how consistent the laminate thickness is. Now, we teach you how to make tools that accurate. You'll find many times in the industry tool variances in cavity thickness are the norm, and they shouldn't be, because part of the critical features needed in the process, be it conventional RTM, which we're going to talk about, or RTM Lite, which we're also going to talk about, which is a more recent innovation in the industry, it's still based on having tools that were built accurately. So that's critical. So just what we consider accurate. Well, there is always some tolerance involved. Now this mold was sheet waxed to 120 thousandths. So I'm measuring right there at 117. I'm getting 124. Uh, right there, I'm at 124 again. I'm at 130 right there. 127. So you see, we're, we're within 10, 12 thousandths of target, which for this particular application was plenty accurate enough. With a bit more precision on our process controls of vacuum and pressure, again this was injected, you'll see in that video, uh, under the first time injection, I should mention that is the first part that came off that mold, uh, we could get that down a couple three thousandths variants. The, the point is the tool was built accurately. Key number one. Key number two is to understand then what influences the air to leave. Well, let's talk about our two different types of processes for a minute. 
When we look at a mold here, let's just talk about a flat shape. It doesn't make any difference if we could add geometry. We'll get into that in a moment. But let's say RTM, what everyone considered the original process, resin transfer molding. In that case, we would normally inject in the center of the part, and then these would represent the outer perimeter. So what we would do is we would inject in the center, and we would exit at the four outer perimeter corners. Very typical. Someone said, John, we've got this box. Uh, you know, where are we going to inject? I'd say, well, we inject the very bottom. In this case, we would have injected, in this case, straight down here. And we put a vent here, here, and in the other two corners, the other half of, of the box. Would have been very standard, would have gone on about our business and never thought twice. And we did it that way for 20-some years until RTM light came out. But think about what's going on here. We inject in the center, the resin then flows outward in typical ring fashion, filling. But the point is, it's diverging away from the injection point, the injection point being here. RTM light, what's the difference there? Basically, it's the same mold, lighter structure, because it doesn't need to hold back as much pressure. We've drawn atmosphere out by pumping some atmosphere out with a vacuum pump, which we've talked about. Now, in that case, we don't inject in the center. And this, that I'm about to tell you, is the fundamental difference between RTM, which was a diverging flow path, from the point of injection diverging away. The biggest difference between the two processes is The RTM light process is a converging, converging flow path. What does that mean? It means that we inject around the perimeter of the fiber pack, around the outer edge of the mold. Where here we vented at the outer edges of the mold. RTM light, we inject around the edges of the mold. Subtle in sense, huge in performance. Let me show you. We now inject around the perimeter, so we have the largest area, all focused, heading towards the center of the mold. What this is doing then is we've got the largest area continuing from the fill towards the center, all focused on getting to that center point. I'll illustrate it this way. Take a crowd of people walk into a room, and we're all trying to get to the very center. Well, what's going to happen? We're all crowding in. Well, the ones in the leading edge are getting elbow to elbow. They're getting tighter and tighter, looking around, saying, hey, but, but they're fighting to get through the glass is what's happening with the resin and the mold. Ourselves, we're just trying to get through here without bunching up with crunching each other. Ones in the back are saying, come on, come on, let's move, let's move. We're all saying, look, we're getting as fast as we can. So the ones in the back start looking around. They say, well, where else can I go? They see a little spot over there, they go over there. Well, think about the resin doing the same thing. The resin's flowing through the mold. The leading front edge is jammed up because trying to get through the glass. The resin in the back's trying to go. It can't go forward fast enough. So in a converging path, the front leading edge becomes a, a restrictor, forcing the global area of wet resin behind to look for a void. Very critical. That is what would allow, let's say, for whatever reason, we had a dry spot here. Resin flowing right around it. It will, before it gets to the vent, go over there and fill that dry spot up. And you would actually see a little line of air bubbles going right to the vent. In conventional RTM, we had a dry spot. The resin, once it finds its way to the vent, it never looks back. It's out. Well, what would we do back then? We open the mold up, mix up a little resin, pour it on that dry spot area, close the mold back down, and re-squeeze it, we'd call it. You may save the part, you may not. But you've lost a molding cycle for one, and you've likely sacrificed the part in the end anyway. Far less scrap in a converging path. And fundamentally, that's the big difference. So. How do we maintain that push towards the center? Remember I described as the front leading edge of the resin 
has to have resistance. That's the key. So we get that, first off, by having accurate molds. If our mold starts out 120, but it goes over here, it's 160, 180, 110, the resin's going to flow, even in a converging path, it's going to flow to the area of least resistance, at least at first. So, oh yes, there's tricks. On a vent here, you can put a patch of glass right under the vent. So when the resin gets to it, if it did get ahead, again, a little more resistance, a little, little more in the very front edge, slow it down, forcing it to go back and look where it's missed. Well, you do that, no doubt. However, we talked about loading the glass into the radiuses. This is why. We don't want the resin to racetrack up that corner and say, well, heck, I could, I'm not going to go through that bend of resin there. I'm going to go through the outer radius around it and never build pressure, back pressure in there. So that's the key. Understanding what makes the air leave is this simple. The air within the cavity will remain in the cavity. The two will cohabitate. I'm going to probably find the part here. We've got them all over the classroom where there will be air, little air bubbles, maybe something large like a worm ran through the edge. We call it worming in the radiuses. Or like you may not see in the camera, but there are a few air bubbles in this back laminate here. Well, that's caused by the fact that the air within the cavity was not encroached on by the resin. The pressure of the resin didn't try to compress the bubble of air or the pocket of air. What happened then is the resin's flowing, the air's in there, and the air's going, well, come on by, I'm okay, as long as you don't crush me, we'll just stay in here together. And you pull the part out of the mold, and sure enough, the air is in the radius or it's wherever. Now, again, it's not completely dry white glass, but there's air in it. Now, it may be on the gel coat side, so there you've got a gel coat repair. On the back side, it may tend to crack with flexing. What we want, again, is the fiber to fill it. That's what takes care of that problem. But understanding what's going on. If the air is not compressed, then the air stays. But the moment you try to change the pressure of the atmosphere of that bubble, that's when the action occurs. So the resin coming in flows around the bubble, or stays right behind the bubble, pushing it. Pushing it straight to the point where it knows, well, look, I'm getting encroached on by all this incoming resin, but there's a vent hole right over there. That's lower pressure. So inherently, it goes to the lower pressure point. So when we've got this converging path, we've trapped the air. That's the fundamental difference. Now, as it compresses that air, as I've described, it goes right out the vent. So how do we do that? Well, accurate tool I keep coming back to, most critical. Second, fiber that fills the, the cross-section of the laminate. Today we're blessed with these chopped materials. This one happens to be chopped fiber, a knitted fiberglass center and chopped. It could be a, a felt-like material in the middle. But the beauty of all these materials that are out there are the loft the fluffiness, the ability to fill the mold cross-sectionally to create that damming effect, but yet not so much damming that we can't get through it. Because if it was to stop the resin, well then we've got the hydraulic pressure of the resin opening the mold up, totally obliterating our accuracy issues that we work so hard to achieve. So it's a combination of being able to control the speed the resin's coming in in harmony with the resistance of the fiber. So what you need is first a fiber that will fill. If I have 120,000th laminate, I can't put in a material that's only 30, 40 thousandths thick. It won't fill the part cross-sectionally. That's why we don't use cloth all alone, typically, in light RTM or even in conventional RTM. If we do, we have to calibrate the tool precisely to the thicknesses of the cloth and wherever there's an overlap, we had to calibrate in for that overlap. What we want are materials that have give, just as we're showing here, that can compress and expand as needed. So if you had an overlap, a minor overlap, you can't have four or five overlaps here, you're going to fill the mold cavity right up. Because at 30% by weight fiber, it's about 17% by volume. So we can tolerate an overlap. It's still roughly a third of the mold laminate thickness. But the material will compress in that area. Where there isn't an overlap, it's still got enough loft to touch both halves of the mold. Fundamental. And then 
shapes as this is, we use this in the class often, is because it's a small part, but simple in the sense that we have to fill it and fit it into these corners and sorts. So it's a great learning tool. The, the point then is the materials will tend to stretch. Now we can't stretch them too far, or we lose their weight variance per square inch or square foot, meter, however you want to evaluate that, but, but they take shape. <laughs> it's a godsend. You know, 20 years ago, so many projects would have been 10 times easier if we could have formed the glass and had memory to stay there. It's beautiful. All right. So we're filling the mold, beginning with having loaded the glass properly, tight into the radiuses, closed the mold down, brought it under vacuum level inside the cavity. Remember the perimeter clamping area is under the highest vacuum. We're talking about RTM light, because frankly, 99 point some percent or in the high 90s, applications today are served most practically with the light RTM, which I've said to you, you call it what you want. The big difference is the converging flow path, allowing us to take advantage of vacuum for clamping, for assisting in differential pressures in the cavity and enabling us the most important thing that we have a converging path to the center vent. So we've closed the mold, we've clamped the vacuum around the perimeter, we've pulled our half at least of the atmosphere out inside the cavity, now we begin the injection. So every piece of injection equipment, if properly designed, will give you control of your flow rate. Pressure alone, that's back where we were 2001, 2003, the zip technology. We said zero injection pressure gained to atmosphere. In other words, if we're injecting into the mold, remember we had that 14.7 PSI in the beginning. We pump half of that atmosphere out, we still got 7 PSI of clamping force to deal with. That means when we inject, if we stay within that 7 PSI pressure, well, we would never open the mold up. And in principle, in practicality, that's true. But we can't control by pressure alone. What we control by is flow rate. Because if we're working ourselves right up to that limit all the time, we're often going to open the mold. What we do now is we control to a flow rate that we prescribe that will fill the mold without overpressurizing it. And then our machine has to react to a pressure limit. So you set a limit. Let's say we set the limit at 1.2 bar, we begin injecting, and we then stay underneath that limit, but we flow at, oh, one liter, two liters a minute, depending on the size of part, fiber load and such. We help prescribe that for you. So we give you a flow rate and a pressure limit. Now you inject at that flow rate consistently, never exceeding the limit. You have a very, very consistent product. And if your machine, like our PRG, our programmable machine, it allow you to even step that at different rates. So on the, the, when you're filling the largest area, obviously you can fill faster. So in the beginning you fill faster. As it's becoming closer and closer to the end of the fill, you slow down. Or you in, change the sensitivity of pressures. But you have that ability to tailor the, the injection flow rate. That's the critical key. So in summary, vacuum won't suck the air out like a vacuum cleaner. It also will not take the air out once the mold is filled. Just leaving the vacuum on and thinking it's going to suck the bubbles out inside the mold cavity won't happen. The, the advantage of vacuum works during the dynamic of the fill, and it works to help influence the air by maintaining a lower atmospheric pressure at the vent. And when the air is being encroached on, whereas if it were allowed to be encroached, it's atmospheric pressure. The bubble, the air within the cavity would have to go up. You're compressing it. It doesn't want that it inherently then goes to that low vacuum or the low pressure area at the vacuum vent. That's the key. Hope that helped you understand just how the air is leaving the mold. Any of your other questions, please send them to us. We, uh, we welcome that. That's where we come up with these. These are questions that are asked to us quite often. Uh, you can submit that to info at jhmtechnologies.com <clears throat> or uh, info at rtmcomposites.com. Thank you for your interest today. Hope you enjoyed the video.